Welcome to Overwatch, and welcome to another Coffee Break video. If you can't tell, I might sound a little bit tired, and that's because I am. I literally got in about half an hour ago from flying back from BlizzCon, which was a very long trip, and I'm very, very exhausted, and I'm very, very tired, but I wanted to get something out there because I haven't had a chance to really do so for the last couple of days. So I wanted to get something up and running on the channel at the very least. So where, where do I begin? Where do I get started? Well, I suppose I should just start, you know, running through the, the BlizzCon announcements, mostly focusing on, like, the, the Overwatch stuff. So let's let's begin with Moira. Like, where, where better to start? Moira was very interesting to me. Like, as someone who had a chance now to play her for several hours worth of gameplay, like, the footage you're seeing in the background is literally recorded from the BlizzCon floor. Uh, I got a chance to stream for two hours, and you're seeing a bit of a snippet of it. There is a full gameplay footage thing on YouTube that you can go and watch of all of that footage as well if you really want to see it. Uh, it's got an interview with Scott Lawler who is the senior audio designer or senior audio coordinator person. He basically manages all of it. Everything you hear in Overwatch, it's probably at least decided on by that guy. Like he's the one that's making all these decisions and so he's the one who's sort of driving a lot of that um, decision making and choices behind all that sort of stuff. So you can go and find that and you want to see my opinions, like my full super fleshed out thoughts on Moira and like going very specific into how she works and how she functions and also the new map and stuff like that. It's all there. In general though, yeah, I was expecting, you know, I was expecting not to like her so much because so far every hero has something of a gimmick, right? Like, Anna has anti-healing and strong crowd control, Mercy has resurrect, Lucio has speed boots, and Yada has a debuff and like burst potential basically. Well, Moira doesn't really have that, but then I started discovering, and you'll probably see it in the footage in the background, like I was slipping away from Winston's and Genji's pretty reliably using that fade ability, which is sort of like a hybrid blink and shadow step that makes you invisible to the enemies. Uh, blink and wraith form, sorry, I keep I always mix up um, shadow step and wraith form for some reason. But yeah, it's like a, a wraith form kind of ability, but you disappear to the enemy, like they can't see you, you go invisible. And so you reappear somewhere else, and you can use it to be very slippy. Genjis of course have a hard time against you because you have a beam based weapon, so he'll have a hard time um, deflecting you, he can't basically. He can deflect the, the giant orb, but that's, that's sort of a, a different issue entirely. And what I started finding after a little while was, you know, she's just very, very strong. And I have, I've had people ask me pretty much continuously, you know, what comps is she going to be good in or, you know, what, what healer does she pair with? And to me, the answer is always this. It isn't so much like what healer do you pair her with. It's what healers do you... What supports do you use to facilitate your team? And so if you have a very, very sort of stick together, stack together team... Moira is going to be incredible because her healing output on a group is actually enormous. It's probably the highest of any healer in the game if you're healing a group. And that's insane. That's really, really powerful. So you, you want to use that and you want to put that strength to use. If you're playing a very spread out team like Genji, Moira have no synergy, for example. So if your team has a Genji and you're playing Moira, maybe you want to change something because you're not synergizing at all with each other. You're completely isolated from each other, that kind of thing. Moira Farah is probably another good example. Like Moira plus Farah is isn't really going to get too much done. My only concerns with Moira at the moment are that she might, you know, the, the fan reaction might not be as huge as she deserves, perhaps, but we'll see with that one. Like, fans are, are tricky things, and it's going to be interesting to see how that develops, but I think that it's not going to be as bad as Arisa, kind of how Arisa just kind of, people just kind of went, moo. But with Moira, I'm expecting, like, it's not so much moo, it's more, hmm, like, it, it's more of a hmm reaction, right? It's it's not like the, oh my god, it's Doomfist, like, the, the super excited or even like somber oh my god it's so hype and that might be to do with the hype introducing the character like there was just no build up and it was just announced or it might just be to do with you know how people react to certain aesthetics she's very sort of androgynous in her visual design people don't react super well to that people like you know they like mercy they like you know stuff that's cute like tracer and stuff like that like so that people enjoy spamming thick when may appears on screen and stuff and so that might have an effect on her popularity overall that's a whole different discussion but it will have some kind of impact the map is incredible. Uh, the map is very clearly a labor of love. It's very, very clearly designed by, you know, they they got people from throughout Blizzard to like help build this thing, and they have like all the original assets for everything anyway. So if they want to look at, you know, the actual Ashbringer model, they can get a hold of it very easily. And for the sound design side of things, because I had Scott with me, I could sort of ask about this. You know, they have the voice actors there. They have the people that worked on these games. So like the people designing the map, you know, worked on Diablo 3, for example. And so it's very 
easy for them to sort of use that expertise and use their knowledge to build these resources and to build this map up. Um, gameplay wise it plays a lot like King's Row, it's very flat, a lot of heroes will welcome this map and honestly like I've said it about Junkertown in the past but I still kind of stand by Junkertown will probably be okay in the end when people figure it out and when Mercy gets nerfed. Uh, anyway, different discussion. Um, but Blizzney World, or well, Blizzney Land or Blizzard World, but Blizzney because Blizzney Land will just get them sued. Uh, Blizzard World is going to be amazing, I think. I hope. I really hope. Um, just because it it is very very open to a lot of heroes, so you can play so many different things on that map. I don't think it's going to be easy to just like nail down. This is the comp you play on this map, hundred percent every single time. That said, I do think Sombra is going to be very, very strong on it, so we'll see. Like, there's a lot of large health packs. A lot, a lot of large health packs, especially around the first point. The next thing I want to talk about is sort of like a hybrid thing, I suppose. It's the mixture of being in the Blizzard Arena during the opening ceremony. Oh, well, not the Blizzard Arena, the Overwatch Arena during the opening ceremony. And watching Jeff Kaplan walk out and hearing a chant and starting and helping being part of this chant of people shouting, Jeff, 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 and sort of living that reaction and living that hype. Like, the, this is the thing about BlizzCon that if you haven't been, it's very hard to understand, but there is an energy to the event. There is um, a, a, an excitement to the event. Like the, There is this feeling, this buzz, this atmosphere that is just incredible. And it really sort of permeates the entire thing. And this is why people leave it and just sort of go, this is like this is unique and different and you know if you have like a guild that you play wow with or a group uh, you know a team that you play overwatch with and you have a chance to ever go like try and take that chance because i think going there with like a pack of friends which is basically what you know i've just done where you know it was mostly me sty ryan uh tyridin joined us i finally met tyridin in the flesh we got along incredibly well um so tyridin is an amazing person so i was super happy to meet up with him um, but yeah, like just this sort of this rat pack of YouTubers and sort of streamers and Valkyr sort of bouncing around all over the place because Valk's Valk. Uh, it was, it was incredible. And like, if you have that chance to just go with your friends and enjoy it with your friends, I can only recommend it. So, getting back to where we were, that theme was sort of love and kinship I suppose really seemed to get to Reinhardt's voice actor when he was delivering his opening ceremony speech and introducing the new amazing short and it was just amazing to watch this guy sort of embrace the community and the community embraces him in such a wonderful way and all of the voice actors seem to be sort of undergoing the same thing like watching um Watching Lucio's voice actor, for example, start hosting stuff and sort of being a part of that vibe and that buzz is so cool. And watching them all sort of embrace the community and the community really resonating with them in such interesting ways is really cool. Uh, yeah, the Reinhardt short, probably my second favorite now. Uh, it's really good. It's really, really good. It's kind of a hard press up. I really like, you know, Alive remains my favorite. Like, you're not going to beat Alive with me. Sorry. It's it's my favorite hero. It's, well, it's my favorite villain. Fighting probably one of my favorite heroes uh, in London. It's got amazing sound design. It's got amazing music. It's got amazing cinematography. It's very, very nicely self-contained. Like, you can just show it to anyone and they'll understand it. Uh, Sniper Woman Bad blinky well dashy british woman good like that kind of stuff it's very very easy to understand there's only one blemish on it which is the no and you get rid of that and it's perfect uh but alive is always going to be impossible to beat for me right uh but this uh honor and glory really good really really good like i'd say you know you're wrestling up against infiltration and dragons and stuff for like is it up there in the best? And I think it definitely is. Uh, it's also nice that it's got like a, le a lesson for players in there. You know, where where the hell were you, Reinhardt? Your, your soldiers are getting killed here. Like, yeah, it was cool. It was just very, very cool. And it was cool to just embrace that. Otherwise, like, all the other Blizzard news was really exciting to see as well. I've been a Blizzard gamer since I was about six or seven years old when my brother bought Orcs vs. Humans when we were on holiday in Canada and brought, we brought it home with us and I just got hooked on it. So I've been playing Blizzard games pretty much all my life. So it's always very humbling to sort of be there and be involved in some way in that production and be involved as a part of it behind the scenes, I suppose, and get access to all this stuff. 
The other thing I want to touch on very quickly is the esports. Uh, the World Cup was incredible. It was amazing to watch. It was absolutely heartbreaking to watch Team UK. We literally had myself and Stai and a couple of others. It's like Stai's wearing his Union Jack hat and he's got a cape on. I'm wearing a Union Jack around my neck uh, as a cape as well. And we're we'll watching it going, no! There's a, we kind of suspected it was going to happen, we kind of knew it was coming. We tried to keep the energy high and excitement high because A, it's it's fun to be hyped about something and it's fun to give a little bit of bants and B, it's it, like the team thrives on that kind of energy so you, we wanted to sort of present this very strong uh, appearance, at least outside appearance to help knock Sweden perhaps off balance a little bit and keep our guys feeling good. But yeah, there were practice issues and there were all kinds of issues behind the scenes that most people probably will never find out about but Team UK were not in the best position uh, at the end of the day and we got punished for it and basically we just underperformed which is a huge shame and I think it's the biggest shame to me is like people were slating Chris and I really think Chris like deserves pretty much nothing but praise for his performances he's been playing extremely well he has one of the healthiest attitudes I've seen out of a pro player and I think Christopher is going to go extremely far definitely if you're looking at Overwatch Esports his is a career to keep an eye on I think Mike Ye is going in a similar direction as well as long as he sticks at it um, and Cruz is developing as a player like and that's that's what I'll say about Cruz at the moment is he's developing and growing and learning and it's a shame that he's sort of going through this learning period now but this learning period needed to happen Otherwise, the, the finals were great. South Korea were incredible to watch and showed some extremely high level play, but to their credit, the USA sort of staggered them a little bit. I will say there was probably an element of South Korea not taking it hugely seriously at the start, but even when South Korea seemed to start ramping it up and taking it more and more seriously, they were still finding difficulties in dealing with Team USA. So, like, Team USA went out early, but there is no shame in it. There is absolutely no shame in it. Like, the you know, if you think, oh, well, both UK and and USA went out in the round of eight like those teams were leagues apart team USA looked phenomenally good and were probably the second best team there to be honest Canada however were a complete shock Canada were a huge surprise and were brilliant to behold um, it was it was just great to see them again just going sort of at similar pace to South Korea and just looking good against them um, Canada yeah there's some good surprises there cool Matt always performing on the diva uh, absolutely keep an eye on that guy if you are interested in watching like and figuring out how diva is played go and keep an eye on that xqc doing the best he can considering the situation on the winston like south korea were doing a lot of plays and more i'm getting a bit analysis -y, but i'll finish up on this quickly don't you worry um like south korea being very very clever around xqc um because he had to basically deal with flowers widowmaker so he would jump on on that and then basically the two south korean tanks were just waiting you know it's sort of like it's the old ruse you know of chase you know a, a kid like taps you on the so uh, shoulder and like runs into a dark alley and you go hey kid and you chase after him and then like two big bruises sort of come out the shadows it's literally that thing of well the Winston's chase widow and now these two big tanks come out and kill him and so XQC was trying to do the best he could with those resources or that situation I suppose. In terms of Overwatch League, like the hype has never been higher. People are confident. People are like feeling good about Overwatch League now. My only concern at the moment with the spectator client as well, on top of all of this, is that there's a little bit too much white. But pretty much everyone I've spoken to has said, yeah, it goes a little bit too white. It's it's a little bit too white. Um, so I imagine they've heard this feedback and they're probably going to just start tweaking it here and there, just making it a little bit more colourful for the away team at the very least, because it basically every match turned into like white versus red, or white versus blue, or white versus green in the case of Australia. Otherwise, guys, it was a huge amount of fun. If you managed to meet me, like, I would just want to say thank you for approaching me. Thank you for saying hello. It's probably more of a special thing to me than it probably is for you. Um, it really does help energize me and sort of, it always astounds me to see people be so, um, so friendly and so sort of excited as opposed to meet me it's such a, an interesting experience for me so thank you guys who did manage to meet me and say hello i'm sorry if i missed you um i'm sure if you go to another convention there'll be another chance
otherwise yeah I, I had a great time if I had to criticize it just in closing just you know as we wrap up um, the there's only two things that really sort of got to me the first was just not being able to advertise the stream more I only really got a form, informed that I was streaming when I got there uh, about what time I'd be streaming and if I was streaming so that was kind of annoying I didn't know what was happening so I told people for like a week beforehand that oh I'm not going to be streaming I'm not doing anything there I'm just putzing around and then I got told oh no you have a stream slot and so yeah there's, there, there's that one uh, B, well, I, that's, that's again, more business side of things. Like, I would have tried to get over to you to retweet me, for example, something like that, just to get more eyes on the stream, I suppose, because it's good for me, but it's also good for, you know, all of us. The other thing was that, you know, like the What's Next panel, for example, talked a lot about the stuff that came out in the opening ceremony, just went into it in a little bit more detail, which is what you expect, but they didn't really talk about, you know, the issues in Ranked at the moment, or some of the, the challenges facing Mercy, for example, and how they're learning about balancing. Like, stuff like that I would have loved to hear about, so stuff like, you know, how they're going to be dealing with this, this the toxicity, how they're going to be dealing with the, the Ranked environment, how they're going to be dealing with the progression from Ranked to the Open Division, to Contenders, to Overwatch League like how are you going to incentivize players doing that when at the moment you're like I imagine a ton of people who watched the World Cup went man I really want to go and play Overwatch and then they played Overwatch played two games of their placements in season seven and went nothing's changed and everyone's still a bit of an arsehole so I'm not going to bother playing it and that's a shame to me so I'd like to have heard, heard something more along those about those lines and stuff like that Otherwise, guys, I had an absolute blast. Hopefully, you guys did too who watched it. Uh, I've been Josh, one voice amongst many. I am very tired, and I'm going to go get some sleep. Toodles. <laughs>